king, are you not? Amen. I'm glad he's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords and it may have come from a humble beginning in Bethlehem's manger, but he's not in a manger this morning. And I think that's an important thing for you and I to remember at this season of the year. He's not in a manger. And uh, though he was born there and he was laid there, and I believe there was purpose in that, it represents humility. It, it reminds us that he's the lamb. We'll say more about that in the course of the message today. But he didn't stay in a manger. He was born for a purpose, and his purpose was not to live, but to die. And his life accomplished much more than we'll ever measure. The Bible, in fact, tells us in the last chapter of John's Gospel that if we were to write it all down, that the world couldn't contain the books of what he did. That was his life, but in his death, he impacted more than his life. For in his death, he saved us, amen? I'm grateful for that. Good to be in God's house this morning. Appreciate what God has already done in our hearts in the service today. We are in the book of Luke today as we kick off this Christmas revival. Luke chapter number two, if you'll find your place there. In the Word of God, we won't stay there long, but we will be there for a little, for just a few moments this morning, Luke chapter number two. I encourage you to keep your Bibles open as we look at the Word of God together today, and I'm excited to see what the Lord has for us. Amen. Luke chapter number two, as Bible students, you know the content of the majority of this chapter, as I made reference to at the banquet last night, that it speaks about the the most renowned and probably the, the best known accounts of the story of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm grateful for that. We understand that. And as we scan through Luke chapter number two, we find the child being born and we find that uh, uh, the angels have came and praised God and notified the shepherds that are there in the fields. And then verse 21, and that'd be the only verse that I read this morning, but in verse number 21, and this is what the scripture said, and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision, for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Let me just read that verse again. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. I have a very simple thought on my heart that I trust the Holy Ghost will empower us to deliver today, and that's this thought, Jesus makes a difference. Jesus makes a difference. I I think about as we enter into the Christmas season and, and all of the things that are surrounding us in This season of the year, all the traditions, all the history, all of the things that we think about. I think about the fact that we, uh, so often, if we are not very careful, we'll neglect the reality that Jesus is the difference. Somebody said Jesus is the reason for the season, and I would not disagree with that. Of course, we know That is an accurate statement, but I would go a little bit further and make this observation that without Jesus, there would be no cease. What purpose would we have in our decorations and our gifts and our get-togethers, our traditions and our history and our heritage? They would simply be empty and void festivities representing and meaning nothing if it wasn't for Jesus. In fact, Jesus makes a difference. To those that don't like to celebrate or they have that bah humbug spirit about Christmas, some would often say it's just another day. Well, could I assure you that if it wasn't for the difference that Jesus makes, in fact, that's exactly what it would be. It would just be another day. Amen. But Jesus makes a difference. What a precious and lovely name, the wonderful name of Jesus. I was listening to the ensemble as they sang this morning, and I have been asked at times, preacher, would there be a song that you would like sung that would accommodate or, or accompany your message? They did not ask me, and nor did I expect that they would, but if I had been asked, I couldn't have chosen a better song, for they begun their special by saying, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus 
makes a difference, amen? We know that in the name of Jesus, there's great confirmation for he is the savior of the world. There is great condemnation for those that do not accept Christ uh, are condemned already. And there is a consolation for to you and I, it is the sweetest name that's ever been heard, amen? I think about the accounts of the gospel uh, in my text this morning as they come to the temple as the child reaches his eighth day after birth and he is circumcised as a male Hebrew child would have been that they call his name Jesus. This was first prophesied in Luke chapter one and verse 31 as that angel appeared to the Virgin Mary and said to her on that particular day, you're gonna bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Throughout the pages of the gospels that name Jesus becomes louder and louder. Matthew chapter one and verse 25, we find the reference and he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called, speaking of Joseph, he called his name Jesus. Although Mark says little about the birth of Christ representing his servanthood, uh, but in Mark chapter one and verse number one, that great gospel account said the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Even John, and in John's gospel, he is portrayed as the Son of God. There is a, there is a focus and an emphasis that placed upon the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the gospel of John, he's referred to as the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. But in verse number 17, as John continues his discourse about the light of the world that lighteth every man, he makes this statement, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The evidence of God's grace is made manifest in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so for a little while this morning, I'm preaching on Jesus makes a difference. Jesus makes a difference. I wanna look at with you two or three instances in the word of God where Christ has made all the difference in the world, first of all. What about the story here in Luke chapter number two? Here's a group of shepherds that are, as the scriptures say, abiding in their fields by night. Here's the story of an unusual encounter with heavenly hosts. Here's a story where these men, that as far as we know, are just ordinary blue collar men and better busy about the business of raising sheep, uh, suddenly have an encounter with the God of heaven. May I say to you that as their lives progress, uh, uh, they do not brag about the fact uh, uh, that angels came and uh, uh, visited them in the fields. Uh, uh, they do not magnify the reality that they had a personal message from heaven and that said unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And but for the rest of their days and throughout all of eternity, and there will be a magnification of the reality we met Jesus. You see, it was not angels that made a difference. It was not supernatural things that transpired in the heavens that made a difference. It wasn't the star that shined over the place where the young child laid that made a difference. But it's Jesus, oh, it's Jesus that makes a difference. When I think about the shepherds, I am first reminded of their purpose. He did not appear to the bankers. He did not come to the carpenters. He did not come to those that worked in this capacity or in that capacity even to the farmers. But he came to the shepherds. Some have even speculated that these particular shepherds may have been Levitical priests, that, that they came as it would have been the custom in those days, uh, uh, that there were so many Levitical priests that they, they, they had uh, evolved, if you use that word loosely, into a position 
of raising those lambs that would become the sacrifices on the day of atonement. Perhaps this is so. All I know is that they were about the business of sheep. They were interested in lambs. Their purpose was raising lambs. In other words, they were intrigued by, interested in, seeking after, and in need of a sacrifice, a savior, the lamb that would that would satisfy at God and sanctify man. They were looking for a lamb. That's their purpose. But then we hear the proclamation as they are attending to those sheep in the Judean pastures that night. Suddenly the scripture said the heavens were full of these heavenly hosts, these angelic beings as they somersault and and uh, and shout their way across the skyline saying glory to God in the highest glory to God in the highest suddenly one of those uh, uh, one of those creatures of light uh, makes his appearance under those shepherds gathered in that field in that hillside uh, and they're afraid and they cower down uh, only to hear the angels say fear not uh, uh, for behold, I bring you good tidings uh, of great joy which shall be uh, to all people. Uh, uh, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, uh, which is Christ the Lord. Uh, wow, what a mouthful. Uh, three statements are made in that conclusion. He is the Savior. There's a capital S. Uh, he is Christ. Uh, there's a capital C. Uh, and he is Lord. Uh, and there's a capital L. All proper names or titles. Uh, as Savior, he came for the reason that I before mentioned. Uh, to die in our stead. Uh, to be the substitutionary sacrifice uh, for the sins of humanity. Uh, as Christ, he is the fulfillment of the promise. Uh, He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the one with the high and lofty office. And as Lord, capital L, O-R-D, he is Jehovah. He's God incarnate. He's God in the flesh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So our shepherds are affected by Jesus. Their purpose is clear. They were looking for a lamb. The proclamation is clear. Today a Savior is born. But notice their prize. And may I say to you, and I want to be clear when I say this, that the fact he came is amazing uh, but if you do not receive him it does not impact you uh, uh, and the fact that angels declared to those shepherds in those hillsides uh, uh, and that a savior is born is a phenomenal thing uh, and that beggars our understanding and imagination uh, uh, but if they had not accepted Jesus uh, he wouldn't have made a difference in their life uh, 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 but the thing that is important here is in verse number 12. Uh, the Bible said, and this shall be a sign unto you. And then you might want to underline the next three words. Uh, in Luke 2 and verse 12, it said, ye shall find. Hallelujah. That uh, there is a promise uh, of a prize. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The scriptures go further in the text to remind us uh, uh, that as the angels disappeared into the night sky, uh, those shepherds said one to another in verse 15, uh, uh, let us go even unto Bethlehem and see the thing which is come to pass which the Lord hath made known to us. Uh, now I want you to notice we seen two wonderful things. Yeah. One, Brother David, there's a promise. Yeah. If you're looking for him, you'll find him. Yeah. If you need him, he's available. Yeah. At number two, there's a commitment. Yeah. Let's go find him. Yeah. Let's go see this thing. Yeah. But may I say, as we've read these verses, yeah. Yeah. in verse number 12, no difference. Yeah. Yeah. In verse number 15, yeah. no difference.
difference. Uh, there's still shepherds that are empty. There's still shepherds that are needy. Uh, but the difference is clear in verse 16. Uh, and they came with haste and found. Uh, now they found Mary. That didn't make a difference. Uh, they found Joseph. But that didn't make a difference. Uh, and the thing the Bible said uh, that they found that babe uh, lying in a manger. Uh, uh, in verse number 17, uh, they didn't talk about angels. Uh, they didn't talk about journeys. Uh, they didn't talk about Mary and Joseph. Uh, uh, but they talked about a child. Uh, uh, they talked about Jesus. Uh, uh, they talked about a Savior. Uh, I'm afraid this morning that there's a lot of folks uh, that better well acquainted with a Christmas story. Uh, that baby in a manger, God incarnate. Uh, uh, but they never accepted him. Uh, and may I say he's not making a difference in their life. Uh, uh, there's even those that have said to themselves and said to others, uh, in time I'll get saved. Uh, in time I'll get right. Uh, in time I'll come to Jesus. Uh, uh, but it hadn't made a change in their life. Uh, uh, because they never came to the Savior. Uh, uh, there's even been those that have heard the promise uh, uh, that come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, uh, they've sought, uh, they've heard others make that promise. Uh, uh, they've heard the witnesses say, uh, what a change he'll make in you. Uh, but they stood at a distance and only looked in, uh, and Christ has never made a difference in their life. Oh, but Jesus will make a difference. You're searching for something. He can fulfill it. And the proclamation is true. And the prize is given. And the person can be found. And come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Jesus makes a difference. And so we find, first of all, that he made a difference to the shepherds. Look in the book of Ephesians. Turn over a few chapters in your Bible to the book of Ephesians. I'm in chapter number one. We see that Jesus made a change, made a difference in the lives of these shepherds in Luke chapter two. But let me hasten here in Ephesians chapter number one to show you uh, if we look down in verse number five, verse number five, Ephesians one and verse number five, the Bible said, uh, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children uh, by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom, verse number seven, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. What a story. May I say in Luke 2, Jesus had made a difference to shepherds. But in Ephesians 1, Jesus made a difference to sinners. Amen. I've never been one of those shepherds on a Judean hillside. But I most certainly have been that sinner that was in need of a Savior. You say, now, Brother Moore, what kind of difference does he make? We've heard that. We've heard that mentioned. We've heard it preached. Uh, uh, but what kind of difference does he make? Well, uh, there's at least three things that are dramatically obvious in this text. One, uh, that Jesus makes a difference to sinners uh, uh, because he, he gave him a place uh, he could fit in. Amen. Uh, look at that verse. The uh, Bible said in verse number six, uh, he hath made us, I'm in the end of that verse, uh, he hath made us accepted in the beloved. He hath made us accepted in the beloved. You know what, as we used to say down in the deep south, somebody ought to hold the mules and let you shout about 30 minutes, amen. He made a difference. Jesus made a difference to sinners because the marks of sin has rejected us and caused us to be outcast. In fact, the scriptures remind us that when sin is in a man's life, when a man is a sinner unsaved, that he is separated from God. 
Amen. I know it sounds real politically intriguing to have every denomination and group get together and hold hands and light candles and sing kumbaya. I understand that. Uh, but the reality is that if a man's never been saved by the grace of God, he is an enemy of God. And he can come all he wants to with all of the passion of his purpose. And unless he's been saved, unless he's embraced the cross, unless he's accepted the Savior, his prayers will fall upon the deaf and ears of God. For God doesn't hear the cry of a sinner unless it's the cry for salvation. Amen. You didn't fit in. You're on the outside. You were a reject. But now, thank God, we're not outcast anymore. We're not on the outside anymore. But in Christ Jesus, we've been made accepted. It didn't say we were acceptable. It said we've been made acceptable in him. Amen. We are clothed in his righteousness. Amen. Our favor with God is based upon his merit. And may I go a little further and remind you that the prayers we pray and that are heard by the heavens above, those prayers are only heard because it is him, it is the son of God that has given us a position of favor in the throne room of God himself. We've been made accepted in the beloved. Now, I need to hasten to say, it's Jesus that made a difference. Amen. I wasn't made accepted because I was a member of the church. Amen. No, no, that might make me a religious sinner, but I'd still be unsaved. I wasn't made accepted because I'd been baptized. That might have made me a cleaner sinner, but I'd never been saved. Amen. I wasn't made accepted because I offered good works or good deeds or good efforts. Those are nice things to note and they might make you a better countenance on a sinner, but you'd still be on the outside. You'd still be unacceptable. You'd still be rejected, amen. But I got good news. If a man comes in Christ Jesus, he is made accepted in the beloved, amen. He said we found the faith, we found a place to fit in. Then in verse number seven, the Bible said, in whom we have redemption, through his blood, I'll come back to redemption. But notice the latter part. He said even the forgiveness of sins. May I remind you that Jesus has made a difference to us sinners because he gave us a place we could fit in. And then number two, he gave us a peace that only comes through forgiveness. Now listen to me. I'm glad this morning that a man that's saved by the grace of God can know the multifaceted peace of God. We can know what it is to have peace with God. You know how you have peace with God? When the, when the, thing, that has a, when, when the thing that is between you and God, when the thing that has offended God. Have you ever considered the fact that you and I as sinners offended God? We were an offense to God because his eyes are too holy that he cannot look upon sin. He cannot behold iniquity. And when he looks at us, he was offended that even though he gave us life and he caused us to live, even though he did all the things that he has done for us, we still disobeyed him. We still transgressed his law. We still refused to keep his commandments and we sinned against him. And your sin is not against the government. It's not against the church. It's not against your family. It's not against your neighbor, but it's against God. We had offended God. The only way, beloved, that you and I could ever reach a place where we could be in God's fellowship was if the offense had been taken away. I may have told this here, if, you, if I have, forgive me. It's a wonderful illustration, I'll abbreviate it. I heard a missionary some years ago in Murphy, North Carolina, and he was in uh, somewhere in Africa, I do not recall his country, but he was in a big city in, in one of the countries in Africa, on the African continent. And he said that uh, there's a lot of cultural things that you have to learn, and there's a whole lot of things that you have to incorporate into your mindset that are not anti-Christian but are just part of the culture. And he went on to describe a situation that there was a young man and a young woman that came to their church and they both got saved and they had a child and, and turned out they were 
they were living together. They'd never been married. Well, they wanted to write that. Now that they've gotten saved, they knew that wasn't the way God intended for them to live. Could I have a little amen right there? Amen. And so they wanted to write that. That's not as easy as just coming down the aisle and saying, I do. Because he wanted to write the relationship. Both of them were from villages, and he wanted to write the relationship with her parents and, and in their case, the entire village that she came from. Because as far as they were concerned, Brother Merriman, as far as they were concerned, he had stolen her. He had taken her. She belonged to them. He had stolen her. And so he said that over the course of time, they wanted to get married. They wanted to begin a family on the right footing that they should begin on. And he said so, uh, he said he learned that there was going to have to be blood money given. And he said, uh, he said, why can't he just go and apologize? Why can't he just go and tell the village or tell her parents that, that he, he's sorry? And he said, this doesn't work that way. There'll have to be a price paid. And so they, they made arrangements. They said, they said this man will never speak for himself. He'll have to have somebody else speak for him. And so he was to ask for three men that would go and speak on his behalf. There was an older African gentleman there in the church, and he understood the culture, and understood the situation. And so obviously he would be the mouthpiece, and then there had to be character witnesses. And so another young man that was there in the church agreed to go, and he said he asked if I would go. He said it was several hours for us to travel from the big city out to the village where this young man was from, or where this young lady, rather, where this young lady was from. And he said we traveled, it was hot, the roads were rough. He said we got there after several hours, four, five, six hours of driving. And he said we got there and I, 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 I stepped out of the car and the other guys that were with us stepped out of the car. And he said I noticed the young man, he was with us, the young man that had committed the offense, the young man that had stolen this young lady was still sitting in the car. And I said to him, I said, aren't you going to get out and stretch your legs? And the older gentleman said, oh no, he can't. He said, if he steps out of that car before the blood money's been given, he said, they'll kill him. He's offended them. So we pulled up in front of the place where they'd agreed to meet. And he said, the elders of the tribe were there. Several of the older women were there. And he said that we pulled up and he said, it's a hot day. The windows remain rolled up. This fellow's sitting out in the car. He's hot. It's sultry. He's suffering, I guess you'd say. He said, the three of us got out and we went inside. He said, it was somber. It was solemn. Everybody seemed angry and upset and uh, nobody was cordial. Nobody was warm. He said, we sat in a big living room and he said, he said, we begin to negotiate. The older African gentleman is negotiating and he said they begin to determine a price that's going to be paid for this young lady who's been stolen away. He said that conversation in African tradition went on for what seemed like two or three hours. He said it was just a lengthy, drawn out process. And he said finally they came to a price and he said somebody looked over at the door of the kitchen and there was the mother the matriarch of the tribe, and she nodded. She was willing to accept the fact of the money that had been given and, and that this young man that's committed the wrong is still sitting out in the car. And so they agree on the terms of the retribution. They agree on the price that'll be paid to right the wrong. They appeal on what's going to take to overcome the offense. They shake on it and said, suddenly, as though somebody snapped their fingers and the lights came on, that matriarch, this, 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 this African woman comes to the door and, and she's got an apron on where she's been in the kitchen and they've been preparing food for three or four hours. The whole time we've been in there, they've been preparing a meal and said they, yet they act as though they're not happy we're there. It's just a, it, it's kind of a, a contradiction and said, all of a sudden, Said that, uh, that woman walks over to the door and throws the door of this house open and she yells out in the yard, come on in, come on in. Everything's well now. And said that that young man stretches those long legs out, gets out of that van and when he walks inside, it's not that, 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 that division, there's not a separation. But he said she throws her arms around him and she embraces him and all the men embrace him. And, 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 and what, what's made a difference? Somebody has removed the offense and so now there is a communion 
a happy communion. We had offended God. We were separated from God. But 2,000 years ago, the price was negotiated and settled on the bow of dark Calvary. And now the doors are swung open wide. Come on in. The offense has been taken away. I found a place to fit in, but I found the peace that comes from forgiveness. You see, the reason we're not at peace with God is because our sins have wronged God. But when the offense is taken away, the peace of God is evident in our lives. The peace with God is clear. He condemns us no more. The sins have been taken away. Then there's the idea of the peace of God. Isn't it wonderful to know that once a man gets saved, it's not just the reality that he's not wronged God anymore, that that wrong has been taken away. But it goes deeper than that because God begins to put his peace in our life and we begin to approach things as God approaches things. There is a difference in the life of a sinner because he meets Jesus. You won't find that in the church. You won't find that in society. You won't find that in effort and deed. But you can find it in Jesus, a place to fit in, the peace of forgiveness, and then to be reminded that we are the purchase of the Father. Don't ever forget that Jesus is the price. Amen? God the Father purchased our redemption with his own son. Let that set in for a few moments. God the Father purchased our redemption with his own son. You show me a greater manifestation of the love of God. You tell me how much more can God show you he loves you than what he's already done. It cost him the prize jewel of heaven. One writer said he bankrupted heaven so that he could buy you, you being that pearl at great price. He sold everything to acquire you and that meant sacrifice his own son. Jesus makes a difference. Well, you're in Ephesians. Turn over a couple of pages to chapter number three. If Jesus made a difference to the shepherds in Luke 2 and Jesus makes a difference to the sinners in Ephesians 1, then I assure you in Ephesians 3, Jesus is making a difference in the lives of his saints. Pick up in verse number 14. What a good place to jump in. For this cause, Paul writes, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's our Savior. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We're not talking about sinners now. We're talking about saints. We're talking about those that have come already to the Savior. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge and that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him that is able to do exceedingly, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, amen. May I say Jesus makes a difference to the saints. You say, preacher, what do you see in the text? Well, I'm reminded that Jesus is the common denominator of our relationship. We're part of the family. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me magnify that for a couple of minutes this morning. I'm grateful that I'm a child of God. Amen. I'm a son of God. What a privilege. Amen. Amen. I'm a child by birth. I'm a child by adoption. It's been sealed. It's been recorded. It is what it's supposed to be. I am the child of God. And it said it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And that's in the context of beloved, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us in that we should be called the sons of God. Amen. Amen. Why am I a son? Because of Jesus. Amen. 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 Let me say that again. I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God because of Jesus and exclusively and only because of Jesus. That's the only thing 
that's ever made a difference. I'm a child of God. But as a child of God, I'm part of the family. The songwriter said, we say brother and sister down here. Amen. I just came back from Europe and sometimes in the churches that's not as common. I was surprised to find that. Now some of the American missionaries, yes, but amongst the British believers, they they don't tend to use that brother-sister expression like we do, Brother David. And I don't know that bothered me. I'm just going to be honest about it. I, I didn't preach on it, but it bothered me. I like the fact that we're brothers. Amen. 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 I, have a, I have a blood sister. I have a, a sibling by birth. Uh, one sister. Never had a brother, but I'm going to promise you, I, I've got brethren. I've got brethren in this church that I believe would do whatever was within their human capacity to come to my aid and assistance. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm just going to be blunt about it. If it wasn't for Jesus, I'd have never had a reason to come to Madison, Virginia. Amen. Right. Seemed like a pretty countryside, and I always enjoy my visit and, and, uh, and all of that. I mean, but just to be honest, Madison, Virginia? Right. Really? I mean, I think I read about that somewhere in a history book sometime or another, one, you know, and I don't mind going and seeing the historical sites, but they want to charge you too much for that, amen? And so, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I'm just saying, you know, David Oliver, I like you. You're, you're my brother. But I don't know if I'd ever met you if it hadn't have been for Jesus. Amen? If it hadn't have been for Jesus, Brother Yancey, I, I appreciate the fact you're my brother, but I don't know that our paths would have ever crossed but short, I, I appreciate you and the ministry that you have in the church, and you're my brother. But I don't know if we would have ever crossed paths if it hadn't have been for Jesus. Amen. Amen. I've become friends with your pastor, Brother Freeman. I consider you a friend. But in all of our previous years, if it hadn't have been for Jesus, I don't know that we would have ever had that communication where his cell phone number would have been in my phone. Amen. But the common denominator in the family of God is that we have Jesus, amen. amen? We come from different backgrounds and social status and financial status and, and, and cultural statuses, amen? But it doesn't make any difference. We're brothers and we're sisters in Jesus. Amen. What a wonderful thing to be part of the family of God. What I'm trying to say is that as a saint, and I don't mean that I'm saintly, but as a saved individual, as a saint of God, Jesus has made a difference. And one of the things that's made a difference is it made me part of the family. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. My, my wife, her family, I don't know, as, 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 as matriarchs and patriarchs pass away, those big gatherings become less. We've been married this year 14 years, and so I've been around the family about 16 years and when I first came to be a part of the family, they had these monstrous get-togethers. Any family gathering that needs name tags to identify who they are is too big. <laughs> Just saying. Amen. Now, she's going to remind me afterwards that I never went. That's right. I knew of them, but that was far enough. Amen. They'd rent out a fellowship hall and have all the, well, her dad's one of 11, and then you got all the... The, 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 the children and then the grandchildren and now the great-grandchildren and all of those pieces of the puzzle, you know, they all, you know, they all come together and that's part of the family. Well, I don't do well in those kind of crowds and they're good folk. But I didn't know what it was like either. I, I, Mom and dad are, raised us in the house of God, always, always in the church house. My dad got saved before he and mom got married, just a few weeks before they got married. And, and, and mom and dad raised us in church. Huh. And to be honest, in my growings up, I don't know if that's good English, but y'all got the message. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we didn't deal a whole lot with my family. And I got to be honest, it wasn't as much us. And somebody looked down at us and said, yeah, y'all thought you was better than everybody else. But no, it really didn't have anything to do with that. They didn't really have anything to do with us. Right. You see, because we weren't going to incorporate their lifestyle into what we were doing. We weren't going to go drinking and cussing. And I tell the story, and, and, and they're both in heaven now, Brother Friedman, but my, my, my mother's mom and dad divorced when, before I was born or about the time I was born. And so that was a long time ago. And, 
And so there was always a split family. And at one point, my grandfather did get back in church and there was fellowship on that side. But my grandmother didn't get saved till six weeks before she died. And, and I don't mean to be off color. I, I promise I wouldn't say that. She's my grandmother. We loved her dearly, but she was a wicked woman. I, I mean, I'm just telling you, she had done all the sin and continued to do them even into her senior years. I'm just a vile woman to the point that my mom on purpose shielded us and, sh and protected us from that, amen? And, 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 and I'm grateful she got saved and I saw a different woman for six weeks before she slipped into eternity. But I never had that family connection, amen? Because there was a greater connection in my life and that was Jesus, amen? amen. Same thing was true on my dad's side. There's more of them in prison than there was that could attend the Thanksgiving dinner, amen? And I, I'm not being mean, I'm just being honest. But God in his mercy and in his grace had saved my mom and saved my dad. And so they just started raising us in church. But we found out in church we was part of a family. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm talking about an extended family of men and women and boys and girls that have one thing in common. Amen. I can't sit down with Marcus and talk much because he wants to talk about football and I have no idea. I couldn't tell you who played yesterday or who will play tomorrow. It don't make no difference to me. I, I'll be honest, I roughly know the game, but if you want to get into the particulars, it'll be in trouble because I can't get along with it. I don't know. I can't talk about it. Amen. I'm not going to be able to talk about running heavy equipment with some of you guys. I'm not going to be able to talk about shouldering a, 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 a 30 alt 6 and going deer hunting with some of you guys. I'm just not going to be able to keep up that conversation. We don't have that in common but we have something else in common. Amen. We have Jesus. Amen. Amen. If we ever get together, and I gotta get on with it, but if we ever get together and start talking about Jesus, we've got a common thread that unites us. We're part of the body, we're part of the family, and it's because of Jesus. Jesus has made a difference Amen. in our lives. Amen. 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 We see in the text, he's the common denominator of our relationships. Then we see, in the text that he's the comforter within us. Look at verse number 16. He said that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might. How? By spirit. We are in the inner man, Holy Ghost. How's that gonna magnify itself? Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. My goodness, amen? Hey, you say, preacher, has Jesus made a difference? Sure he has. You see, let me, let me explain something to you. There is, there is a discerning power in the indwelling Holy Ghost, but there is a constraining power in the indwelling Holy Ghost. Thank God for both. There's been a lot of times when the Holy Ghost has spoke to me about a situation and said, don't. He's warned me. He's alerted me. He's even condemned me. Amen. But there's also a constraining power in the Holy Ghost. And I mean by that, that there are times when my flesh would have gotten the best of me and I would have done some things or, or fallen to some temptation or some trial that I was not apt to handle, that I was not capable of resisting, but I'm glad that when I was weak, he was strong. And oh, what a difference that he didn't just save us and leave us but he indwells us and because he lives within us there is a power in us that makes a difference Jesus makes a difference it is the it is the the spirit of god the comforter that dwells within us i need to move on look at the third truth the spirit the comforter within us and then there's the comprehension of his love verse 18 he said that we might be able or we may be able to comprehend with all saints, who can get in on this? All saints. Amen? Little and big. Yes, sir. Children that get saved can know the love of God. And senior citizens, uh, hoary hairs, as the songwriters refer to them, can know the love of God. Amen? Look what he said. That we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And to know the love of Christ. Amen. Sometimes when, when there's a huge tension between me and my children, I know none of you parents ever had that, 
Discipline is more the object of the day than affection and games. On more than one occasion, I've said to them, you know I love you. And they always have to respond affirmative. Can I tell you that it doesn't matter what my lot in life may be when I look up to the heavens above, I have to say, I know he loves me. We just look around us and we begin to see that we are the recipients of the great love of God. How much he loves us. Amen. Amen. Isn't it amazing that when we were lost, it was the love of God that brought us to the knowledge of the Savior in precious verses like, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and now we shout about that love. But how about the fact that since we've gotten saved, that the love of Christ is shed abroad in our hearts and that there is a tangible evidence of God's love in our lives that is not in the world because Jesus makes a difference. Notice number four. There's five of them here. I'm almost done. Notice number four. He tells us in verse 19 that we can know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. If you ever get a hold of that uh, oxymoron right there, you'll shout a while. He said, you can know what passes knowledge. I didn't write the book. I just get to preach it. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I'll let that soak for a while. He said, he said that we can know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I just wrote in my notes that there is a completeness because of Jesus. When God made man, he took a rib out of him. Therefore, man was never complete until God made him a mate and brought her back. And because man has the spirit of God giving him life, he's never been satisfied or contented until God comes back. Well, I'm glad that in Christ he fulfills us. He, he's everything. He's my reason for living and my life that I live. He's my happiness. He can become my happiness. He is my holiness for I have none within myself. He is my help. He's a present help. In the time of trouble, the songwriter said, I do not know how others make it through who never go to Calvary as I do, but I'm glad I have a source. Amen. I've got a resource that I can go to. Why? Because I know the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ will help you face difficult trials. The fullness of Christ will help you go through dark times. The fullness of Christ will help you go to the grave and die right. Because he is, if you're empty, he's everything. Lastly, you'll find in these last two verses that it speaks about the caliber of his power. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. You ain't got to pray it down. It's according to the power that worketh in us. I'm, amen. Look at the, you say, preacher, Jesus makes a difference to saints. Oh, yeah. He makes a difference. Because of the caliber of his power, he's everything and so much more. Hey, by the way, do you know in John chapter 14, Jesus said you could do the works Jesus himself did and greater works than these? Why? Because of the indwelling spirit of God that is within us. Because he goes to the Father, and whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in the name of Jesus, he'll do it. Amen. Wow. I'm just saying, we've got the power, we've got the help, we've got what we need because Jesus has made a difference. He is the reason for the season. Amen. And he's a reason for a whole lot more. He made a difference to some shepherds because he was the lamb. He made a difference to sinners because he's the sacrifice. He made a difference to saints because he is the spirit that dwells within us. Oh, what a change since Jesus passed by. But knowing that there's a baby in a manger, you'll learn that if you go by the local park and find the nativity set up. No, I have no issue with that. 
knowing about Jesus because a Christian merchant put a, a blip in his advertisement for the holidays that said Jesus' birthday. Knowing about him won't make a difference. But accepting him changes everything. Has Christ, has Jesus made a difference in your life today? If not, he wants to. He's longing to. He's waiting to. Jesus makes a difference. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Brother Freeman's coming, concludes the invitation. Let Jesus make a difference to you.